The brain sciences seek to understand how neural activity produces behavior. Many people find the subject fascinating, partly because our brains define us, but also because they may be viewed as information processors, which opens the door to quantitative analysis. Anyone who ventures into the subject is struck, on the one hand, by the brain's daunting complexity, yet, on the other hand, by the remarkable and inspiring progress made in the brain sciences, especially over the past 50 years. There's also the obvious social need for further advances in the brain sciences. Everyone in this room has a family member or a friend or a family member of a friend who's been touched by some dysfunction of the brain, including, of course, psychiatric and neurological disorders and a variety of other in, uh, disorders, including addiction, which I'll mention again later. For all of these sources of human suffering, there are many treatments and substantial knowledge, but for none is there any detailed understanding nor a satisfactory cure. This was the motivation behind the current BRAIN initiative, which is a very helpful effort to, find, to, to fund the basic science needed to understand brain function and dysfunction, but from my perspective, it is remarkably underserved by statistics. This is the primary message of my lecture. I'm going to deliver this message by showing you a few examples of scientific questions that have generated interesting statistical problems by reviewing for you at a high level the statistical ideas used to solve those problems and then by observing that such solutions require an appreciation of the statistical paradigm, which is the name I'm using for what I understand to be the essentially universal guiding philosophy promoted by advanced statistical training. Having described the importance of the statistical paradigm for the brain sciences, I'll then say a few words about the importance of the statistical paradigm more broadly. Excuse me. <clears throat> Before I get going, I want to suggest to those who want to learn more a review paper I wrote with 24 other authors, about a third of whom I would call statistical, the rest being biophysicists who model neurons and neural networks. And there's also this book, Analysis of Neural Data, from which I'll be taking several figures today, labeling them Keb for Cass, Eden, Brown. Emery Brown is an MD, PhD that is a practicing anesthesiologist with a PhD in statistics, who is a professor at both Harvard Medical School and MIT, and he's also a renowned neuroscientist from whom I've learned a great deal and collaborated with since I first got into this field 19 years ago. Uri Eden was Emery's first PhD student, and he's now a tenured faculty member in the Department of Mathematics and Statistics at Boston University. Most people outside of neuroscience are exposed to it mainly through fMRI studies, which often show pictures of brain activity under particular experimental conditions. But my own research has focused mostly on analysis of neural spike train data, which is the kind of data that appear in the examples I'll go through today. So I need to give you some background. And for this, I always begin with a striking graphic that does a very nice job of illustrating something I think most of you already know which is that the brain is located in the head. And you probably also remember that neurons communicate primarily through rapid electrical discharges known as action potentials, or spikes, which take place over approximately one millisecond. When placed on an axis representing the several hundred milliseconds it takes to execute a behavior, such as moving your eyes towards something that captures your attention, the neuron will emit multiple spikes collectively known as a spike train. A spike train consists of an irregular sequence of points in time, and in probability and statistics, an irregular sequence of points in time is modeled as a point process. I'll come back to that shortly. I need to add that action potentials are generated as a result of inputs from other neurons across synapses. And these inputs can be either excitatory or inhibitory. Exp excitatory inhibits increase the electrical potential, that is the voltage, while inhibitory inputs decrease the voltage, with excitatory or, inhib or inhibitory inputs driving the voltage toward or away from the threshold at which the neuron will fire. You can see this in the recording, in this recording. Um, you can see in this recording how the subthreshold voltage meanders up and down due to the excitatory and inhibitory inputs. The subthreshold voltage is often modeled as a random walk of upward and downward voltage steps drifting toward the firing threshold. 
And for theoretical purposes, after passing to the limit, the random walk becomes Brownian motion with a drift. So here's a simulation made by a graduate student in statistics and computational neuroscience at Carnegie Mellon, Spencer Kerner, showing above some of the excitatory and inhibitory inputs in blue and red as time evolves along the x-axis, and below the resulting voltage together with the output spikes, which roughly resemble real data. I'm playing the simulation about 10 times more slowly than it would occur for a real neuron. This random walk summation of inputs remains one of the standard conceptions of neural behavior. Now, a fundamental question in neurophysiology is how do neurons carry information? And the simplest textbook answer is that a neuron responds to a stimulus by increasing its firing rate. Here's another textbook drawing showing a monkey trained to look at the center of a screen in front of him while an electrode records the spikes from a single neuron in his primary visual cortex, also called area V1, where information from the eye first er enters the cortex, the gray matter of the brain, which is so highly developed in humans and in non-human primates. On the left is a picture of a typical electrode sitting near a neuron from which the electrode records activity. And on the right in the drawing, you see that when a bar of light is moved across a small segment of the visual field known as that neuron's receptive field, it starts to fire much more rapidly than it would fire when the bar shines somewhere else in the visual field. By the way, the recording procedure is painless. We vertebrate animals have no ability to feel anything inside our brains. When this kind of response of neurons in primary visual cortex was first observed in what became a very famous series of experiments, many of these neurons were also observed to respond preferentially to a particular orientation of the bar of light as shown here on the left in part A with a firing rate of a particular neuron in spikes per second or hertz on the right in plot B, plotted against the orientation angle measured clockwise from the orientation that produced the highest firing rate. This is called orientation tuning. And the idea that neurons are tuned to particular features of a stimulus is now ubiquitous in neurophysiology. Thus, much neurophysiology and much statistics is aimed at figuring out how neural firing rate is related to behaviorally relevant variables. But what about variability? Especially in the cortex, spike trains are highly regular, irregular. In the figure on the right, each dot represents the mean firing rate across many repetitions of the experiment, that is, many repeated trials. But you'll notice the Poisson-like tendency for the variability to increase with the mean. This is also extremely common. And when we look in more detail at spike trains across many repeated trials shown in the top plot, we again see variability both in the spa spacing of the spikes within trials and in the spike times across trials. In the bottom plot is a histogram made by counting the number of spikes within time bins across all the trials, then normalizing in units of spikes per second. The histogram shows the way the firing rate evolves over time but it has, it has done that by averaging away the trial-specific variability. Those are some basic characteristics of neural firing patterns in a single neuron recorded from a single electrode. These days, recordings are also made simultaneously from, many, from <clears throat> multiple electrode arrays. And new electrode arrays with ever greater numbers of recording sites are being developed by many neuroengineering labs and companies. One popular electrode array, known as a Utah array because it was developed at the University of Utah, is shown here next to a US penny. It has 96 electrodes in a 10 by 10 grid with the corners removed, and it can record anywhere from about 25 to more than 100 neurons simultaneously. I'm going to play a short video displaying Utah array data collected by former Carnegie Mellon student Ryan Kelly, now at Google, and Matt Smith, now a professor at the University of Pittsburgh. The electrode array was implanted in primary visual cortex, area V1, of a monkey, as in the cartoon I showed you earlier, except now you'll see real data recorded with the Utah array when the monkey was watching a movie, which will play at the top part of the figure. The circles are receptive fields of individual neurons, which turn red when the neuron is firing rapidly. Down below are the spike trains, 
from 128 neurons recorded simultaneously. This illustrates a typical statistical challenge of figuring out what these spike trains are responding to in the visual image. Okay, that was the background material. Now I'm ready to describe my selected examples of neuroscience questions that have led to interesting statistical problems and solutions based on the statistical paradigm. Out of dozens, I've chosen three. I begin with the question, how are memories consolidated? The work I'm gonna tell you about, very briefly, is centered on the hippocampus, a region of the brain that lies below the cortex and was first shown to be essential to memory storage by Brenda Milner and her colleagues in Montreal after a patient known as HM had his hippocampus removed during surgery for intractable epileptic seizures. The surgery succeeded in greatly relieving him from seizures, but left him unable to store new long-term memories for people, places, and events. These studies led to many others, and it became clear that long-term memories can become much stronger over the hours or days following initial memory storage, a process known as consolidation, presumably as neurons in the hippocampus send signals to and strengthen connections with other brain areas, which is thought to occur in a process of replay of firing patterns in the hippocampus. This may be one of the benefits of sleep or of non-sleeping rest. Here are two representations of data from a single neuron in the hippocampus of a rat while foraging in a circular pen approximately two feet in diameter after chocolate pellets had been sprinkled throughout the pen. On the left, in blue, you see the path of the rat, and the red dots are the locations of the rat when this one neuron fired. You can see the tendency for the neuron to fire whenever the rat ran through a particular location. And on the right is a visualization of a statistical model of the so-called place field for that neuron the place field being analogous to receptive fields I showed you previously. Rodents have been used extensively to describe hippocampus activity in detail during such navigational memory tasks, including the phenomena, phenomenon of replay of spiking patterns. This slide from my colleague Uri Eden illustrates spiking patterns among 13 neurons recorded simultaneously from a rat's hippocampus while the rat runs down a linear track. And you can see, with the help of the color coding, that the neurons have been ordered according to their place fields. On the left, you see the replay activity of those neurons when the rat was at rest. But here, there's not an exact match of the pattern. And in fact, each time the rat runs down the track or rests, a somewhat different pattern occurs. So to investigate such phenomena, how should we define replay? A reasonably straightforward strategy is to fit statistical models for the place fields and then use them to assign probabilities to particular patterns. This strategy, the one Uri followed, is based on point process regression models. It is described in some detail in our book and it has roots in work of David Brillinger, which he described in his Fisher lecture now almost 30 years ago. That's how the place field on the right was found, and it's also how replay can be analyzed from a rigorous statistical perspective. Although it might take considerable work, it is conceptually straightforward modeling within the statistical paradigm. I've presented two scientific questions that have posed interesting statistical problems and have led to novel data analytic techniques. I discussed these particular examples in support of my primary message that the brain sciences are remarkably underserved by statistics. I'm now going to elaborate. Applications of the, st the statistical paradigm in the brain sciences are rare, which is ironic in that neuroscience is full of statistical ideas. For example, to describe ion channels, Markov models are used. To understand two-choice decision-making, there's a theory according to which a particular part of the brain evaluates a likelihood ratio and another part of the brain computes the sequential probability ratio test. And a popular theory of sensory processing is based on Bayes' theorem, which led to a proposal of specific neural mechanisms that might implement Bayes' theorem. So it's ironic that in the analysis of neural data, infiltration of statistics has been so slow, yet it's explicable. I mentioned earlier that most of my colleagues, my co-authors on this review article are by training physicists. 
There's lots of interesting biophysics involved with the functioning of neurons, so there's lots of physicists in neuroscience. Because these people tend to be very good at math and computation and looking at data, Nova, novel analysis methods are devised mo mainly by physicists. In principle, that's fine. Many physicists are statistically savvy data analysts, that is to say, they're also good statisticians. The problem is, many are not. Or at least they sometimes may not recognize a need to provide a solid foundation for a method. As a result, when I first got into this subject, Emery Brown and I commiserated at great length about our shared perception that work reported in neuroscience articles, even when involving sophisticated techniques, often fails to make full and effective use of available data. Quantitative analysts lack, who lack advanced knowledge of statistics often devise clever methods, but their whole approach to data analysis is different. No such person would ever come up with the methods I have outlined for you here. Faced with patterns of replay, they might devise some metric that measures how far the replay pattern is from the behavioral pattern. To assess synchrony, they might analyze cross-correlation, which limits their ability to build in known features of physiology. Or, as I indicated, they may determine a pseudo-data procedure that has no apparent statistical foundation and thus sometimes leads to inflated error rates. How does the reward system function differently in psychiatric disorders and addiction? This will give me a chance to leave you with a very serious statistical challenge, and it also returns me to something I said earlier, that at the present time we have no detailed understanding of brain disorders. At some point in the future, say 50 years from now, science and technology will provide vastly improved therapies. Tools that can move us in this direction have already advanced enough that the outline of how this might work is coming into focus. We can expect there to exist technologies that combine specific behavioral contexts, perhaps using virtual reality, together with targeted drugs and spatiotemporally precise disruption of neural circuits, all personalized partly through genetics. I'm going to focus on this part. The figure is supposed to show a non-invasive method known as transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is currently being used but its effects are spatially diffuse. Instead, I'm imagining something that can target less than a cubic millimeter of tissue. And it's not a great leap to assume that in the future, not so very long from now, clever engineers will have invented some such technology. In fact, invasive methods for circuit disruption already exist. They're used mainly in non-human animal experiments. The problem is, to take full advantage of this sort of thing, we'll need greatly improved statistical methods. I want to give you some idea where the challenges are and why they're so important. To do this, I'm going to be concrete in the context of the system and the brain that assesses and transmits value, the reward system. I'm picking the reward system partly because it's heavily studied both in humans and in other animals such as rodents. In fact, human and rodent reward systems are similar in some important ways, which shouldn't be too surprising because reward drives all behavior. Everything we do is either to gain something we find rewarding or to avoid some sort of discomfort. This includes things we share with all other vertebrates, like finding food to eat, as well as things that are uniquely human, like making the commitment to sit through an hour-long lecture where the reward is internally generated from some sense of purpose we've constructed for ourselves. In any case, another reason for picking the reward system is that being central to behavior, it's involved in many disorders of the brain. A typical picture of the way various parts of the reward system interact is shown in this figure, and it's very helpful, but it's static. There's no sense of timing here, even though behavior is constantly changing and the timing surely matters. To be effective in understanding neural circuits with a goal of focused circuit disruption, we will need dynamic versions of such pictures. This poses a deep and challenging problem for statistics, the problem of dynamic network analysis. We want to be able to describe the evolution of neural network activity during behavior. Now, let us assume we will have recordings from multiple neurons in each of many brain regions simultaneously. This kind of thing is just beginning to happen, and it will become common in the next 10 years using a variety of technologies, including not only a variety of electrode arrays, 
but also techniques that image fluorescent signals emitted from labeled sets of, neur of neurons when they fire. Shown here is an endoscopic device that can be inserted deep into an animal's brain. It's basically an iPhone camera on a fiber optic cable, and it's very light so that it can be used on a behaving mouse. Optical methods are not only becoming important sources of neural data, they are also being used to either drive or shut down specific components of circuits so that causal experiments can be performed. Thus, we have a great opportunity to study networks of neurons as activity evolves during behavior, including designed circuit interventions. I'm going to be even more concrete about the problem of, network, of dynamic network analysis. Here's a video of a rat performing a typical rewarded behavioral task while a bunch of neurons are being recorded. When the light on the left lights up, he has to poke his nose some number of times until the light goes off and the one on the right comes on and then he goes and gets his reward on the right. Now, hypothetically, suppose we were studying the rewarded behavior of an addicted animal. And suppose further that we had recordings from many different brain areas simultaneously. We want dynamic methods that at the very least, could allow us to draw evolving pictures that, hypothetically, might look like this at the start of the trial, like this when the light cue comes on, like this when the nose poke action occurs, and like this when the, war, the re reward is consumed. Then we want to change the behavior to cure the addiction, so to speak, by disrupting the circuit at specific places and times. At the start, we might disrupt here, shown with X's. When the cue comes on, we might disrupt here. When the action occurs, we might disrupt here. And when the consumption occurs, we might disrupt here. This is not fantasy, but rather it's an extrapolation from simpler experiments that have already appeared in the literature. And I'm sure this kind of approach and data will be available soon. The problem is we are not ready. We need tools for describing and understanding the flow of information across multiple areas evolving during a task based on noisy data from multiple signals within each of many areas. We can and should begin with existing time series, point process, and multivariate analysis approaches, including all the very nice methods associated with Granger causality, graphical models, and network methods, and many variations of these. However, please believe me when I tell you these tools are inadequate. I don't have time to explain, but we need new ideas. All of this makes me desperate to get more statisticians involved in the brain sciences. Let me try a visualization. I readily admit that a big challenge for anyone venturing into the brain sciences is that they include many diverse disciplines which means there's a lot of terminology and new perspectives to learn. And you, must, you also have to figure out how all these disciplines fit together into the bigger picture. But I've been at this for almost 20 years now, and I think I can help by supplying a statistician's view of the way all these disciplines make up the whole of the brain sciences. So here's my picture. <laughs> and I've just finished explaining that we need help. Let me make one final comment with a few more slides. <clears throat> Much of what I've said today about the importance of the statistical paradigm applies throughout modern life. It is relevant to the way we communicate statistical ideas, to our teaching, and to all our interactions with others. I claimed that it's helpful to identify our shared contemporary view of our discipline. I said it had two fundamental tenets, and I identified this view as Fisher's great legacy. I also believe there's a simple big picture graphic that helps to explain the way practicing statisticians think about the role of statistical models. On the one hand, we have the real world of data. On the other hand, there's a theoretical world, a world that necessarily abstracts from the real world using mathematical formulations, which is where statistical models live, as do all scientific models. To be useful, models must abstract and simplify. This is an essential part of what we mean when we say we are building a model. 
Over the past few years, I've been bothered by the realization that introductory statistics courses do not emphasize this kind of big picture behind statistical practice, and I think they should. I've labeled this failure of our teaching the gap between statistics education and statistical practice. It's really important for students to appreciate the abstract theoretical nature of models and the concept that we do what we can to assess whether the models seem to be reasonable representations of the data, but we don't expect them to be perfect. This picture is supposed to remind us that they can't be perfect because models live in a completely different world, the world of mathematics, not the world of experimental measurement. Furthermore, this picture is different than the familiar population sample picture used by so many textbooks and teachers. And I would claim that the real versus theoretical world distinction does a much better job of capturing Fisher's intention. Fisher spoke of a hypothetical infinite population as in the beginning of his 1922 paper where he said that the objectives of statistics are accomplished by constructing a hypothetical infinite population of which the actual data are regarded as a random sample. He used similar phrases in many other places. And while he often dropped the word hypothetical, I think any reasonable reading of what he wrote would conclude that he intended the modifier hypothetical to be there implicitly. In fact, Fisher railed against the subsequent description of random sampling in the sense of finite population sampling and quality control, which had entered statistics as a way of explaining the Neyman Pearson framework. In several places, Fisher argued that general scientific inference should not be understood in terms of what that picture may suggest, namely that random samples should be considered analogous to what were called acceptance procedures in quality control, where the objects making up the population were known as lots, which would then be sampled and examined. In his 1956 book, he said, where acceptance procedures are appropriate, the population of lots of one or more items, which could be chosen for examination, is unequivocally defined. The source of supply has an objective, empirical reality, whereas the only populations that can be referred to in a test of significance have no objective reality, being exclusively the product of the st statistician's imagination. In our contemporary context, I like the word theoretical better than hypothetical. But my intention is the same as what I understand Fisher's to have been. So let me add this picture to my interpretation of Fisher's great legacy. What I've tried to do today is tell you the big lessons I've learned applying statistics in the brain sciences, which have led me to the conclusion that brain research is underserved by statistics. I've shown you just a few examples of the way the statistical the, of, of the way the statistical paradigm has contributed to research in the brain sciences, I've indicated it could contribute much more, and I've added here at the end my opinion that introductory statistics courses should emphasize this kind of big picture. But Fisher also realized that this perspective, which is the starting point for statistical practice, goes beyond science and beyond statistical pedagogy. This kind of statistical thinking, the internalizing of this statistical paradigm, contributes not only to science, but to citizenship. Writing in a different era and worried about totalitarian challenges to science, Fisher put it this way, there is something rather horrifying in the ideological movement represented by the doctrine that reasoning, properly speaking, cannot be applied to empirical data to lead to inferences in the real world. He went on, the intellectual freedom that we in the West have taken for granted is now successfully denied over a great part of the Earth's surface. The validity of the logical steps by which we can still dare to draw our own conclusions cannot therefore in these days be too clearly expounded or too strongly affirmed. Worries we now have about our contemporary social political reality are different, but they are equally troubling, or as Fisher said, rather horrifying. 
and must lead us to the same commitment Fisher suggested. Let me be clear, I'm not talking about any specific political party or elected officials, I'm not. I'm speaking about our citizenry, where there is a widespread inability to appreciate or reluctance to accept that data drive progress, and wherever there are data, progress requires grappling with uncertainty. In Fisher's words, following the logical steps by which we draw conclusions. So again, what does statistical thinking contribute not only to science but to citizenship? Nothing could be more important. The thing we must do be a better job of emphasizing, the point Fisher was emphasizing is that these abstract theoretical representations, when they are able to capture important features of the real world, are exactly what we need in order to make progress. A sentiment best captured by the famous quote from George Box that represents the quintessential statistical attitude. All models are wrong, but some are useful. Statistical thinking contributes to citizenship by encouraging humility in recognizing that variation creates uncertainty, supporting appreciation of theor theoretical principles for turning information into knowledge and action, and fostering pragmatism through discerning that while these principles apply to the real world imperfectly, the process of combining abstract theories with empirical data is the key to progress. Other disciplines may have their own indirect ways of encouraging humility, supporting theoretical principles, and fostering pragmatism. But statistical thinking demands it. We statisticians have a special responsibility and imperative to communicate our way of thinking when we do science, when we teach, when we talk to friends or strangers, because every day, Every time we look at data, we are confronted with the problem of making, face, making progress in the face of variation. And we are the ones who begin the process, the process with the understanding that all models are wrong, but some are useful. Thank you all for listening.